who was a family therapist, a psychologist, and a rabbi. He wrote a book called A Failure of Nerve, Leadership in the Age of the Quick Fix. In this book, he defines an effective leader as the person who is able to maintain a non-anxious presence in an anxious system. In this book, Friedman says that all organizations are by their very nature anxious. Families are anxious. Companies are anxious. Hockey teams are sometimes anxious, especially if you're an Oilers fan. <laughs> Boards of directors are anxious. Armed forces, committees, charities, benevolent organizations, and churches are all anxious, especially churches. Their anxiety arises from the possibility that things will change and the fear that things won't change. It arises from their lack of vision and where there is vision, it arises from the demands that the vision places upon each and every one of them. In all of these cases, the leader will be the person who is able to be calm to be calm in the midst of other people's anxieties. Unfortunately, people often see this lack of obvious anxiety on the part of the leader as a lack of caring involvement. And I think that this week's scripture gives us a perfect opportunity to examine this. As I said, I really appreciate uh, the theme story in the Old Testament lesson where it illustrates how the Hebrew army of Saul was afraid of Goliath and their fear absolutely paralyzed them. David, little David, <laughs> entered as the non-anxious presence in the midst of their paralyzing anxiety. In the gospel lesson, the boat and those within it create an understandably anxious system. And here we find Jesus is the non-anxious leader whose lack of fear is mistaken for apathy by those within the system. Teacher, they cry out, do you not care that we are perishing? In his answer to this question, Jesus reveals to us the secret of how to be that non-anxious leader that is so desperately needed in our current culture of fear. Do you not care that we are perishing? And I think that ha it has become the big question of our age. We ask it of our leaders, our ministers, our communities of faith, our teachers, our politicians, and we ask it of each other. We see ourselves as victims and we cry out for someone, anyone, to care, to care for us, to save us. And when they don't, we echo the question the disciples asked Jesus, don't you care that we are perishing? We ask it even though the assumption upon which it is based is by, by and large not true. We are not perishing. Hard to believe, but the crime rate is actually down. Joblessness is down. Manitoba has the lowest unemployment rate in the country. The economy is in a slow but steady recovery the safe and reliable kind of recovery. And wherever you go, there is construction, and boy, can I attest to that, <laughs> so that the roads eventually will be safer. Air travel is safer, our food is safer, and our medicine is safer than ever before in the history of our country. We live longer and we live better, more comfortably with more resources at our command than in any previous generation. And thanks to, thanks to technology, our questions are being answered 
and our problems are being solved at rates never dreamed of. But none of that has changed our perception that the world is more dangerous than ever. We live in a culture of fear. The human species is prone to miscalculating risk. There's more at work than frazzled modern nerves. Canadians are fearful, truly fearful. And when they're asked, a majority with certainty will say that the world is more dangerous than it ever has been before. Even in the face of evidence that negates this misperception, there is no relief. We lock our doors, we say our prayers, and still we wake up and don't sleep well. Fear is tearing society apart. And those in charge of fears, warranted or not, find them to be fertile ground. By creating new laws based on zero tolerance and requiring longer prison terms for those who break them, politicians position themselves as champions of the oppressed, masses who are, they insist, each one of us. They run their campaigns based not so much on what they plan to do for the voters as on fear of what the other side may do if they are in fact elected. Meanwhile, home security systems are sold faster than they can be put out on shelves. Generators are, for power failures are often prominent in um, ads on television. And what they know is fear is good for business. Well, in December of 2019, a virus was identified. The Canadian Institute for Health Information computed three lessons to be learned from that experience. Calmness. Calmness counts. When the first Canadian COVID patient arrived in British Columbia in January of 2020, some politicians and news media outlets seemed to be vying to see who could create the most panic. And much of the country had been, was whipped into a full out freak out mode. And as I learned from Friedman, what was needed was a non anxious presence in the midst of anxiety and fear. The second thing they offered was let science lead. In this case, that non-anxious presence was best represented by the scientific minds at the Canadian Institute for Health Information. And while they made mistakes, they fully admitted that their way, theirs was the most measured and rational response to all who stood, who sought to stand before the cameras. The other thing that they suggested was to be prepared. We can no longer allow ourselves to be taken by surprise. Resources must be allocated to those scientific agencies and centers that are best able to respond quickly and decisively to the threats of modern disease outbreaks. Policy-wise, the safest place is to be squarely in the middle. A well-measured distance between paralyzing fear and blind complacency. Interesting, this is exactly where we find Jesus in this week's gospel lesson. The Sea of Galilee in those days was about 15 miles long and 8 miles across, and was infamous for its sudden and unexpected storms. Only the most skillful sailors dared to go beyond where they could see beyond the shore. So a direct crossing was always, always risky. And at night, it bordered on absolutely foolish. Yet this is what Jesus asks of his disciples, and they comply. They comply without question. 
The question does not come until they are out in the middle of the lake and a storm has appeared, a storm so violent that the boat is filling with water and in danger of sinking. And the question is, as we have said, the question of all who suffer and are afraid, do you not care that we are perishing? Jesus, who had fallen asleep in the back of the boat, awakes and, and stills the storm. With a couple of words, as a parent might calm an anxious child, peace, be still. If this is simply a miracle story told to demonstrate the power of Jesus over nature, it might well end right there. But you know what? It does not. There is more to come. Another rebuke. And this one is for the disciples. Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? Oh, this little story which Mark has given to us is not so much a story about Jesus as a parable about the nature of faith and its relationship to fear. You see, both Matthew and Luke liked it so much that they lifted it pretty much word for word and placed it in their own Gospels. The only change they make is a little softening of the language when the disciples ask Jesus for his help, and when Jesus turns his eye towards the disciples and their alleged lack of faith. If we insist on taking this story literally, we will find ourselves bogged down in questions about how it is possible for one to sleep in a small boat that is literally filling with water. Why is Jesus so cranky? and abrupt with his disciples, whose fear seems to me anyway to be altogether reasonable, and whether in nautical terms, a dead calm is really an improvement over a choppy one. So I think the real subjects of this story, it turns out, are faith and fear. It is clear that faith in Mark is not simply intellectual opinion, but also trust in God, along with bold action when faced with serious threats to life and to well-being. The lesson taught in this simple story has been, for the most part, truly ignored by the church. We Christians have been taught, and we have passed on this mistaken lesson, that faith has to do with believing things that are hard to believe. Things for which there is no physical evidence, things that seem to defy objective scientific explanation, we have equated faith with belief. Unfaith, we have said, is the refusal to believe a thing that should be believed. As though we can force ourselves to believe things that for all the world seem to be unbelievable. And this disbelief, we have been told, is nothing more than a willful rebellion against God and God's word. Mark's story of Jesus in the storm exposes this notion that faith is simply belief as utter nonsense. For Mark, faith is not believing that a proposition about something or someone is true, but acting as though it is true whether we accept it to be so logically or not. Faith is acting, risking, doing even in the face of admitted doubts. Faith is not propositional. It is a, not an intellectual assent. Intellectual assent requires nothing of us. No risk, no courage, and no action. But faith, faith requires action. The opposite of fear is not disbelief. The opposite of faith is paralyzing fear. The inability to move or to act on those things that we claim to believe in the face of danger. 
Faith is that which allows people and institutions to be the non-anxious presence in the midst of anxiety and fear. It allows us as individuals to act decisively when others are frozen. It allows the church to calmly lead when the culture is mired in anxiety or wandering aimlessly like sheep without a shepherd. You see, faith can divide and separate us as it has our current political culture. It can cause us to become so cemented into our political and theological positions that we are incapable of moving, that we become irrationally de defensive, that we treat anyone who does not fall into total agreement with us as our mortal enemies. And we have seen how the pandemic polarized families and communities and our nation. But reasonable fear, properly informed and considered in a rational, non-anxious way, can bring us together. When I started school in the 1950s, there was a number of my classmates who had been stricken with polio. That polio virus had afflicted thousands of children in Canada and around the world from about 1915 until 1953, when the Canadian number peaked at 9,000 cases. In 1954, Jonas Salk invented the first polio vaccine, and within two years, two years, thanks to a mass campaign to inoculate school children, the incidence had declined by 80%. Today it has been virtually eradicated. All this is thanks in large part to people working together to raise money necessary for fighting this fearful, crippling disease. The March of Dimes, do you remember that? <laughs> the March of Dimes was created by grassroots folks to raise money for fighting polio and treating its victims, and today continues to champion equity, to empower ability. Their mission is to be Canada's leading service provider, resource and advocate, empowering people with disabilities to live and thrive in communities nationwide. The government did very little in this cause. Most of the work was accomplished by private organizations whose commonality and purpose allowed them to overcome what many imagined was an unbeatable, undefeatable foe. The power of our foes may have decreased, but the number of foes that threaten us has not decreased. Disease continues to steal the lives of not just children, but many with whom we love. War now seems to be our default setting. Racism and gender-based violence exists. Violence in our streets still exists. It's still a threat. Drug abuse and addiction still lurks in the darkness. And this I know, these foes will not be defeated by paralyzing fear and anxiety. If they can be defeated, they will be undone by passionate, well-ordered, and committed people led by non-anxious, faith-driven leaders. I am an avid quote collector, and the one that I still love about fear was offered by Franklin D. Roosevelt, who said in his very first inaugural address, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. So may the God who armed David for the battle and through Jesus Christ who stilled the raging storm be in us to conquer our fears. 
and set us on the course to greater faith, a boundless hope, and a passionate healing love of all humankind. Amen.